Well, uh, we are in the book of Mark as a church, the gospel of Mark. And I was just realizing that we started this last September, and we are finishing the last message in Mark on the first week of September. So we will have been in Mark for exactly one year. And for those of you who are new with us, Mark in the Bible is one of the earliest accounts of Jesus' life and ministry. Um, And Mark, uh, the theme of Mark is laid out in the first verse of the book. Mark 1.1 says, this is the beginning of the good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This is a proclamation of good news to the world. And then everything that follows that in the chapters to come, Mark basically puts the words and the works of Jesus on display to verify that initial claim. Jesus does some amazing things in the beginning of Mark. He's healing people. He is casting out demons. He is taking a little bit of food and miraculously multiplying it to feed a huge crowd. And how fun would it have been to be there with Jesus? To walk around and to see this. And yet, the further into Mark we get, about about the middle of Mark, we see the tone change. Where Jesus begins to talk more and more about what is going to happen to him. In fact, why he came to earth to die on a cross. That he's going to be rejected by the leaders and he is going to be crucified and rise again. But the the disciples are having a really, really hard time with this. Because they love Jesus and they're putting all their hope in Jesus to deliver them from whatever it is that they need to be delivered from. But Jesus keeps talking about how he's going to be killed Another thing that would be really difficult is the further we get into Mark, the harder the teachings get. Jesus says, to be truly great, for example, you must become the servant of all. And he says, in order to gain life, true life, you have to be willing to lose your life. Hard teachings that the disciples are having a hard time with. And what we're going to see in our verses this morning is yet another difficult teaching. So if you would turn in your Bibles to Mark 10, we're going to pick up in verse 17. And I want to point out these Bibles around the room and the seat backs in front of you. You can go to page 846 to find Mark chapter 10. Well, we have, um, as you're turning there, I just have a question for you. If you could meet one famous person, dead or alive, who would that be? Some of you might have to think for a while. Some of you might have somebody right now. I'm going to complicate it for you, though. If you could just ask one question of that one person, what would you ask? They're like, okay, now I really have to think. I, 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 I've had the whole weekend, and I, I still don't have an answer. So this morning, though, we're going to see a man who comes to Jesus and asks a very thoughtful and strategic question. Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 17. And Jesus was setting out on his journey. A man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. Well, Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, 
houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. These verses and this idea of of the last being first, the first being last, this is a theme that we have already seen many times in Jesus' teaching that he brings up. In fact, right before these verses, what happens? Little children are being brought to Jesus and the disciples who think they're doing Jesus a favor rebuke the children. They say, get out of here. Basically, Jesus is too busy for this. And how does Jesus respond? He's indignant and he says to the disciples, no, let the little children come to me because, in fact, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. So this question of how do I get in to the kingdom, how do I inherit eternal life, is what this man is asking about. And it's, what, it's come up multiple times. And speaking of this man, Mark doesn't say a ton about him. He just tells us that he's wealthy. He has lots of possessions. But when you read Luke's gospel, Luke adds a little bit more to our picture. He says that this man was a ruler and that he was, quote, extremely rich. So picture that. This guy who is at the top of the social food chain. He was seen probably by everybody in his society as one of the greatest people in the land. And look at how he approaches Jesus. What does he do? Runs up and kneels before Jesus. This extremely wealthy, powerful, well-known ruler comes and bows in the dirt before a poor carpenter from Nazareth. Picture how that must have looked. And so what this shows us, before this guy even says a word, he, he at least respects Jesus. And no matter how society would separate these guys and say, well, this Jesus is just a carpenter. This guy's got lots of money. This man clearly recognizes Jesus' greatness. And so he, he runs up to Jesus. By the way, what does that tell us? He's either training for a 5K. Anybody do that run this weekend? Okay, anyway, some of you. He's probably not training for a 5K. It tells us he's what? He's eager. He's, he, he's excited. He, he wants something. He's urgent. He's desiring. And, and this convicted me this week. I thought to myself, do we run to Jesus? When I get out of the bed in the morning, am I dragging? Well, yes, I am. But what is our desire? What is our urgency to move toward Jesus? When we're going throughout our day and we're busy and we're distracted, is there any part of us that longs to be with him, to worship him? So this guy runs and he kneels and he asks this question, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, we have to give this guy credit here because of all of the questions people are asking in this world today. What should I eat? What am I supposed to wear? Where are we going on vacation? How long is it going to take before I can retire, right? Question after question, this guy asks what is without question the most important question that you can ask in this life. In light of the fact that we are all going to die, the statistics are very overwhelming and convincing on that, by the way, How do I have life beyond this short existence? Wonderful question. And by the way, I'm wondering, again, have you ever asked that question? If this life is not it, how do I prepare for what is coming? That's what this guy is asking. And the importance, by the way, of this question is accentuated by the seriousness of the consequences for those who reject Jesus, according to Jesus himself. Very important question, and I want you to think about it this way. Imagine that you were on the Titanic, and I I know that this is a, yeah, I'm looking at the wrong screen. That's kind of a sobering thing. You just say Titanic, and we get this pit in our stomach, right? But this, it's, these are that kind of verses, right? This is the teaching. How do I inherit eternal life, Jesus? How do I survive past this? Imagine that you're on this maiden voyage on this legendary ship. You're going across the ocean. Everybody is having an amazing time. There's this thrill in the air. They're socializing. They're laughing. They're making business plans. And and if you could drop in on the conversations, what do you think people would be talking about? I would say all kinds of stuff, right? They'd be be learning about each other's lives. They'd be talking about where they're from and, and where they work and their families and things going on in the world, vacation plans, romantic interests. 
But then comes that chilling moment when the Titanic hits an iceberg and everyone discovers that the boat is actually going to sink to the bottom of the ocean. And if you were to then walk around and listen to what people were talking about, first of all, do you think it would be different? And second of all, what do you think would be the most popular question you would hear? How do I get off this boat? How do I get on to this lifeboat? And so in the midst of the sinking ship that we call this world and this life, this guy comes up to the right person and asks the right question. How do I inherit eternal life? And before Jesus answers his question, he says this. Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now that is an odd question considering Jesus is good, isn't he? In fact, the Bible teaches not only is Jesus good, Jesus is God. So why would he say this? I think the answer comes when we realize the title this man uses to address Jesus. What does he call Jesus? Good teacher. You see, Jesus has been called many things in Mark. Lord, he's been called Christ, he's been called uh, the Son of God, he's probably been called lots of bad things. Mark, thankfully, doesn't record for us. But here this man calls him good teacher, and instead of saying, oh, well, thank you very much, I appreciate that, he uses it as an opportunity to teach this man. And here's what I think he's saying. If you just see me as a teacher, then you have to understand I can't possibly be good. Because only God is good. So if you're coming to me just saying, wow, I love your moral teachings, let me just clarify, I'm actually not good. Jesus is being very strategic and clever in the way he's responding here. And this, by the way, is something the Bible teaches. Romans chapter 3 says, no one is righteous. Not even one. No one understands God. No one seeks God. And then referring to humanity as a whole, there is no reverence of God before their eyes. Now, I want to be very clear about what this is not saying. This is not saying that there are no admirable qualities in humanity, that people are all terrible. That is not what this is saying. When you look around the world, we see that we have, we have doctors and we have musicians and we have all of these different amazing qualities in this world, people that are made beautifully in the image of God and loved by God. What these verses are saying, though, is that with all of our admirable qualities, no one is naturally inclined to put God on the throne of their lives. Because that means you have to get off that throne, right? That's what it's saying. No one is reverencing God. No one is honoring God as God. Everybody is being their own God and building up their own morality and their own reputation. So the title this man uses, good teacher, not only reveals his view of Jesus, but his view of eternal life. His view of salvation as sort of this product that we, with our morality and our self-effort, can earn. Jesus, what, what must I do to get that? And the idea behind this, by the way, is that God grades sort of on a moral curve. And there are some who are at the top of the curve. The more moral people go to heaven, the less moral people don't. And and the practical application of that kind of thinking is you just be as good as you can be and hope for the best, right? That's, that's, That's what this guy is at. That's where he's at. How do I get there, Jesus? He comes to Jesus, who he clearly sees as the top of the curve, (laughs) the moral curve, and he's like, what's the secret? Jesus, clearly you're going there. What do I got to do to get there? Jesus answers, you know the commandments. And by the way, it could be argued everybody in this time and culture knew the commandments. They just knew what they were. But I think Jesus is also speaking into this guy's mindset. He's he's talking this guy's language, right? Because this guy's coming, what do I do? What do I do? Okay, well, you know the commandments, and he starts listening. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, defraud, honor your father and mother. And you probably noticed this, but Jesus doesn't list all the commandments, right? Which ones does he list? The last. Five or six, if you wanted to say that defraud was covet, but either way, it's the last five or so. It is all of the commandments, notice, that deal with how we treat people people. It is these horizontal relationships. It is, it is our religiousness in the eyes of this world. He's, he's a good person. I haven't, I haven't murdered. I haven't committed adultery. I haven't stolen. I don't lie about my neighbor. 
I haven't committed adultery. And we're going to see in a, a bit why this is so significant that Jesus lists these. But after he lists these, the man says something startling. Teacher, what does he say? I have kept all these. I've done all these since I was a youth. I, I've, I've been at this for a while, and I've done it. I've, I've kept those commandments. So fascinating to me that even though Jesus doesn't list all the commandments, he does list the commandments that this guy feels he's kept. And I actually think this is, this is incredibly kind of Jesus. He's meeting this guy where he's at, and specifically where he feels he's done a great job. Jesus knows this guy, and it, it, it reminds me, like, if I were to come out and see my kid jumping on the trampoline, doing his best to produce a front flip, okay, and it's not working. Now, I could come out and say, you're not doing it right. Fail, you know, or something like that. I wouldn't do that. I'd be bad. Or I could come out and say, buddy, you are super coordinated. And you know what? You have, you have great height. That's, that's what you're going to need. And I see you tucking your legs. That's exactly what you need. One thing that might help you is maybe like use your arms when you try to flip. So I think Jesus is meeting. He loves this guy. We read that in these verses. He loves him. So he's being kind to him, and he's speaking his language. And the, the purpose of this is Jesus, I love this. It's a beautiful picture of the gospel. God is not standing at a distance saying, come, find your way to me. Jesus comes to us and finds us and saves us. He meets us where we're at in order to lead us to where we need to be. I love that. I love this picture of Jesus here, this kindness. And so he's trying to, to, to lead this guy out of this murky, moralistic thinking that he's trapped in to the truth about eternal life. And after listing these commandments, how, how must this guy feel when he says this? Really good. Like, I've kept all these from my youth. Is that it, Jesus? How do I inherit eternal life? These things. <gasps> I've done it, <laughs> right? And then, though, it keeps going. Verse 21, Jesus, looking at him, loved him. That's a sermon right there, by the way. Not judged him, not ridiculed him, not looked down on him. Jesus, just in his looking at him, loved him. And he said to him, you lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And what? Come, follow me. That right there at the end is the secret. This is where Jesus is leading this man to. Come, follow me. Because for one thing, did you notice Jesus didn't argue with this guy about his, his perceived morality? When he said, I've kept all those, Jesus didn't say, well, hold on. <laughs> Remember that one time you talked back to your parents? Because we've all done that one time, right? <laughs> How is that honoring your father and mother? Jesus doesn't argue about that at all. He lets the guy have that because that's not the point. Morality isn't the point. Even though, by the way, it seems like it could be the point. Someone could read these verses and easily walk away thinking that the secret to eternal life is to obey some commandments. And if you've obeyed a list of five, you just got to do a little bit more. You just got to sell some stuff and give to the poor, and then, then you're going to make it. That would be a very reasonable conclusion based on this alone. But what we realize is that not only does this con contradict everything that the Bible says about salvation and about grace. But the reality is we could stand here all day and argue about our morality in this room. We could line up about who's the most moral, you're over here, who's the least moral, and compare ourselves to each other. At the end of the day, we all still stand guilty before a holy God. That's what the Bible teaches. So it doesn't really matter who compares to whom and how we compare to each other. So Jesus doesn't waste any time on this. He's trying to move this guy to what he ultimately needs, which is to come and follow him. It is to come follow Jesus, to put his trust in Jesus, but the problem is this guy can't do that until he gets rid of some baggage. Imagine again that you're on the Titanic. Now the boat is sinking. And the crew is running around frantically trying to get people onto the lifeboats. And they come up to this particular man who's standing there with his arms full of money bags. And the crew member says, sir, we can get you on this boat. We have one more spot on the boat. You're just going to need to leave that stuff here. Now, the choice in that moment's easy, right? 
You leave the money and you live or you go down with the boat holding on to your bags. The problem, though, is in this life, we're not quite as decisive, are we? And perhaps it is because we don't realize what God's word says about this world, that it is a sinking ship. That all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and that the wages of sin is death, but what? Help me finish that verse. The gift of God is eternal life in who? Christ Jesus our Lord, meaning Jesus is the lifeboat. <laughs> Jesus is the only way. All other efforts fail. Jesus is the lifeboat. The problem, though, is we're carrying around so much other stuff. We're trusting in so many other things that we can't get to Jesus. So this man has just learned the secret to eternal life. How happy would you be? How ecstatic would you be? But how does he respond? Verse 22, disheartened. That doesn't make sense. Disheartened by the saying he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. You see, with all of his morality, he was a good man. With all of his money, none of it made any difference. None of it mattered at all without Jesus. And he knew it, which is why he went away sad. And this wording, by the way, makes it sound like he was sort of like fashionably disappointed, you know, disheartened. I don't know what that word, that word comes from. That word, that Greek word, was used in the day to describe when clouds would roll in and cover a clear day. When it would become cloudy all of a sudden. We could really say we're disheartened right now with the snow, right? The clouds have covered. And so clouds moved in and covered this guy's reality in his soul. He came with a clear sky. He went away with a cloudy day. And it says that word sorrowful literally means grieving. It got cloudy when he realized, I'm not willing to let go of this stuff in order to gain what Jesus has to offer. And so he walks away from Jesus grieving, not because he didn't want to follow Jesus, but because he wasn't willing to do what was needed in order to follow Jesus. And when he walks away, Jesus then looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And, and his disciples react about how we would react if somebody said this. What? They were amazed at his words, it says. And, and it may seem, by the way, here, and I want to spend a few minutes on this, that Jesus is saying that, that wealth is the problem. That money and wealth are fundamentally wrong. And based on that, our application today for everyone is you all need to go sell everything you have and give to the poor. That would be the application if money was wrong, if wealth was wrong. The problem that creates a bit of a societal paradox because then when the poor people get rich, they also have to obey Jesus and sell everything and maybe, I don't know, give it back to you or something. The, the point isn't that wealth is wrong. The Bible actually teaches, in fact, that God is the one who gives people the power to get wealth. God wouldn't do that if wealth was wrong, would he? Deuteronomy 8, in case you think I'm making this up, Deuteronomy 8 verse 18 says, you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth. That's a fascinating chapter, by the way. If you read that this afternoon, they're losing sight of God and they're just focused on their wealth. They saying, don't forget that God's the one who's actually blessing you with all of this. See, when you read the Bible, the problem with this wealth issue is we we, we polarize. We end up in the ditch on either side of the road. And on one side of the road, if you are righteous, you should be rich. That's the argument. Wealthy people are righteous people. If you're righteous, you should have wealth. And then on the other side of the spectrum, there's people who say Christians should always be scraping by. You should always have holes in your pants. Your car should be breaking down on the way to church if you really love Jesus. And I just want to point out, when you read the Bible, you find godly people who were poor. Jesus would be a great example. You find godly people who were rich. You find people who had very little. You find people who were some of the wealthiest people in the land. Abraham, David, Job. By the way, Job, at the end of everything that he went through, it says that the Lord restored the fortunes of Job and gave him twice as much as he had before. That actually, I think, relates to that verse I read before the offering. Somebody who is a, a faithful steward of what God has given them and puts God first in their life, God is likely to entrust more to that person 
That is what the Bible teaches. And, and by the way, this fits with what Jesus says at the end of our scriptures where Peter says, well, Jesus, we've left everything to follow you. Instead of being like, oh, come on, man. Where's your, where's your heart for sacrifice? He says, you know what? Anybody who's left anything is, is going to get, what, what does he say? A hundredfold in this life. Now, I don't know what that means. And then eternal life in the age to come. Now, the danger is when we try to turn all this into a formula, right? God is a genie in a lamp, and we just, you know, God, I need my money. I need my hundredfold now. I'm cashing in. (laughs) The point, though, is it definitely makes it clear that wealth is not this man's ultimate problem. So that obviously begs the question, what was his problem? I would say this. This man's problem wasn't about wealth, but about worship. It wasn't about what he had, but what he valued the most. See, worship is the matter of what is worth the most to each one of us. What are we willing to do the most in order to gain, in order to keep? Some people have said that if you just look at your your bank account, that's a really valuable way to see what you worship. What is worth the most to you? What do you put the most energy into? The time, the money. See, this guy wasn't worshiping God. And do you remember... The commandments Jesus listed, the last five or six, but do you recall which ones he did not list? Number one, you shall have no other gods but me. You shall not make for yourself any idol, nor bow down to it or worship it. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. You shall, you shall remember the, and keep the Sabbath day holy. In other words, all of the commandments that deal with our relationship with God our orientation to God, in, in other words, the ones that Jesus left off his list are the ones that reveal this man had left God out of his life, right? He was his own God, and even though he wanted eternal life, he didn't want it bad enough to follow Jesus, to honor God as God. And what this man learned here, I think, is a valuable lesson that we find throughout the Bible that nobody can serve two masters. That may ring a bell for you because Jesus referred to this a lot. In Luke 16, to his disciples, he said, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, by the way, that word for money is the Greek word mammon, and it means possession. So that's actually a little bit of a mistranslation. It's not just money in your account. It's everything. It's the stuff that we have. And what Jesus is saying makes total sense because think of it this way. If a master, just think of two humans, two bosses, right? If one of your bosses, a boss comes and says, I want you to go clean that up. And another boss comes and says, I don't want you to clean that up. You can't obey both, right? You have to disobey one in order to obey the other. And that's what he's saying is you can't serve two masters. Only one. And it is clear from this story who this guy's master was, or rather what. Another time, Jesus told a parable, a story about this rich man. And it says this rich man had everything that he needed in life. He had arrived. (laughs) And this guy one day said to himself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be required of you. Then who will get what you've stored up for yourself? And then Jesus concludes this parable with these words. This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. You see, the issue with this guy wasn't wealth. It's that in all of his preoccupation with his stuff and with himself, there was no room for God. And it ended up costing him his soul. You see, Jesus, though, gives us the answer in these words, the solution to our problem. He says, come, follow me. It's that simple. Come, follow me. Follow me. Leave whatever it is you need to leave. But the goal is to come follow Jesus. In another encounter, a crowd of people came to Jesus and said, Jesus, what must we do to be doing the works of God? That sounds a lot like what this guy asked, right? What do we need to do in order to get to God, in order to inherit eternal life? And Jesus answered them, fascinating. This is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. Who's that? Jesus. 
See, our, our thinking as humans, it's always works. It's, it's about quantity. It's how many good things am I going to do? How, do I have to do in order to impress God? And Jesus comes and says what? No, it's a work. It's one thing that you lack. Come, follow me. Believe in me. Put your trust in me. All the other stuff will sort itself out. And something that we just have to draw attention to is this reaction that the disciples have he says how difficult it'll be to enter the kingdom of god and it says the disciples were amazed at his words <laughs> and then he says it again children how difficult it will be to enter the kingdom of god it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle that's a fun picture than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of god and it says this time they were exceedingly astonished and said oh, who then can be saved now i want to point out I think the reason these guys were so amazed and astonished is the same reason that this man, this rich man, went away sad. It is because they were only thinking about what they could do. How do I inherit eternal life? And he went away sad because he couldn't do it. He couldn't earn it. And these disciples are like, how do, we get the, how do I get a camel through the Ave Needle? <laughs> and what I want to point out is Jesus isn't teaching here that salvation is really, really difficult. He is teaching that salvation is impossible. You can't do it. You can't get the camel through the eye of the needle. You can't inherit eternal life with your works. That is clearly what he is saying here. It is not about your effort. But Jesus tells us in verse 27, finally, and here's the good news, Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but not with God. Can you say those words with me? But not with God. For all things are possible with God. And I think this comes back to how we think as adults versus how little children think. This is a theme. Adults are all about earning their way. Kids are content receiving. Adults want to plan the path and make the way. Kids are just happy to be on the path. To know there is a path. How wonderful is this? Adults think we can save ourselves. Children know that they need others to survive intuitively. That is why I believe Jesus, when he repeats himself to the disciples, he adds a word. He says, children, <laughs> how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. Now, that was actually a term of endearment. That wasn't demeaning. It was like family, guys, children. But I also think Jesus is reminding them of what just happened in the beginning of chapter 10 where he said, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child, will not enter it. See, I think he is saying, stop trying to wrap your head around it. Stop trying to make it happen. You can't. Believe in me. Follow me. Shed the baggage and come follow me. Right? Worship team, would you come forward, please, and we'll prepare to close. And, and this passage, by the way, tells us a lot about what it means to follow Jesus, what it requires. Not just a prayer we pray and then we go back to our lives. It is, it is something big. It means something. It costs something. And so I want to close with this question for us to reflect and apply and put our finger and allow you to put your finger on what God is saying to you today. What is standing in the way of you following Jesus? And that, that could be something you've never even thought about. Maybe you're a Christian, and this is still for you. What's standing in the way of you really walking with Jesus closer than you are today? You're on this sinking ship. And the question is, what is keeping you from getting on the lifeboat? What are you holding on to? All of this reminds me so much I couldn't help but think of Abraham this week. How God asked him to sacrifice his son Isaac, which, who by the way, if you were here last week, was the answer to God's promise to him for descendants. And God says, I want you to take him up on the mountain and sacrifice him. Crazy. But Abraham takes his son up on the mountain and he's ready to sacrifice him. And we know God never from the beginning never would have allowed that to happen. He wanted to test Abraham's heart. He wanted to see what Abraham or who Abraham was really worshiping. Was it Isaac, his son? 
or was it God? And once God realized, Abraham will do anything that I ask him to, he said, stop, don't lay your hand on your son. I just wanted to know, where's your heart? What is that in your life that you would say, I'm I'm not taking that up the mountain? That's too important to me. Maybe it's something intangible like a relationship that you're holding on to so much that that is it for you. I want to invite you, if you want to follow Jesus today, or if you want to follow Jesus more closely, if that is in your heart, I want to invite you to do something that we don't do very much. Um, I want to invite you to come down to the floor with me. And I'm actually going to come down right now um, as a way of saying, this is me. And I don't have enough time today to talk about the things in my life. Not necessarily great sins, but just baggage. Things that I say, this isn't helping me. This isn't drawing me closer to Jesus. I want to be close to Jesus. So if you want that today, I also invite you to come down and join me. I know that's a lot, right? We could be the only two down here. (laughs) And I want to just pray for us. If you want to keep coming, absolutely come down and just my heart behind this isn't something special or magical in walking down here. It's it's to see that you're not alone. And it's to be able to talk to people and say, what is it that you're going to let go of this week to follow Jesus? Would you join us and pray? Lord Jesus, we are so thankful for you that you are so kind, that you meet every one of us right where we are. Lord, we, we, we repent of believing this lie that we are called to work our way to you. The whole point of the cross and the gospel is that we can't. And that is why you came right to us. Lord, I pray for every one of the people standing down here right now, every one of the people sitting in this room, Lord, that you would meet every person right at their point of greatest need. That you would put your gracious, merciful, forgiving finger on anything that is keeping us from you. And that in that moment of realization would come the redemptive power to let go and to walk with you. Lord, this is not a destination that we arrive at in this life. It is a direction that we commit to. We're going to keep asking this question day after day when we get up, say, Jesus, what's keeping me away from you? Help us, God, to be these kind of people. We love you, Jesus. Amen.